Welcome, everybody. I think people are just starting to join our session. I'm just going to pause for a moment as I see the numbers coming in. I'm Ron Saunders. I'm a member of the DWC Steering Committee. Um, OK, it looks like a number of people have joined the session. Um, so welcome. This is the session on episodic disabilities and the post-COVID recovery. Of course, I hope we can get to post-COVID. <laughs> These days, one is a bit nervous about what post, when post-COVID will actually be. Um, but I'm looking forward to um, a great set of presentations, and we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers um, uh, after the presentations. Um, um, it looks like there may be a temporary issue with the closed captioning for this session, so I apologize for that. We're working on that um, at the moment. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator for this session. Melissa Egan of Realize. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at this session. What an exciting opening to the conference. And uh, we're really excited to be able to share some of the information and research that we've been doing over the last year. Uh, like Ron said, post-COVID seems a little bit far away these days. And, uh, and that is something that I think we all need to grow a bit accustomed to. So some of the research that we will be presenting will be about kind of how we integrate some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the information we've gathered through our research into work as we continue living in a world that likely will include COVID for a long time. So my name is Melissa Egan. I am the National Lead of Episodic Disabilities at Realize. I am joined on the panel by three incredible people. Um, Faraz Shahidi, who is an associate scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. Helen Anderson, the Director of Information and Support at the Arthritis Society. And Elizabeth Harrison, research associate, um, who will be speaking about the Invisibility to Inclusion project uh, that's run out of the University of Guelph's Revision Center. So to start off, I would like to welcome uh, Faraz Shahidi to present. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. So my name is Faraz, and I'm an associate scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. Um, hopefully some of you know about us, but for those of you who are less familiar, the IWH is an independent not-for-profit organization that produces actionable research to promote, protect, and improve the health and safety of working people. Today, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of a team uh, largely based at the IWH. Um, this is a, a, a sort of project and study led by Dr. Monique Gignac, who is a senior scientist at the Institute who unfortunately could not be here today. Um, and so I have the privilege of sort of stepping in and presenting some sort of recent findings based on this broader project that Dr. Gignac um, is leading at the Institute. So just to set a little bit of a stage, both for the study and hopefully for my colleagues on the panel, um, we have heard some version or another uh, of this sort of idea that the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in major disruptions to various aspects of social and economic life in Canada and elsewhere. You hopefully have also heard that due to pre-existing inequities, the adverse social and economic consequences of the pandemic have not been borne equally across the population. So the metaphor we might lean into here is this idea that while we're sailing the same storm, we're sailing it in different boats. And the reason we're sailing it in different boats is in large part, we think, a function of these sort of pre-existing structural inequities in our social and economic circumstances, our access to sort of key resources like employment, income, housing, and so on. There are also, hopefully for those of us in the room, sort of intuitive um, reasons why we might expect people with disabilities to be one of those groups disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and its associated consequences. And this is sort of where our study sets off. Um, we're interested, we, or we were interested with the study in asking the question, how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact perceptions of health, financial security and organizational support among people with disabilities in Canada, particularly in reference to sort of um, workers um, uh, without disabilities, pardon me. And we had sort of two going hypotheses here. Um, again, hopefully both um, intuitive and reasonable to those of us uh, in the meeting today. 
So in the context of a crisis, we sort of um, anticipate that people with disabilities are going to report greater concerns related to their health and finances, as well as lower levels of organizational support compared to other groups. Um, we also have this notion, right, this hypothesis that these disparities in the perceived consequences of the pandemic are going to map onto and sort of be a function of pre-existing inequities in social and economic um, circumstances, including um, the sort of labor market and employment disadvantages that people with disabilities um, sort of face and the barriers they face in the labor market. To tackle these hypotheses, we administered an online survey to a, a broadly representative sample of working adults in Canada during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to be eligible, participants had to be at least 18, employed at least 12 hours a week, and fluent in either English or French. The primary objective, um, just going a couple slides back, was actually this sort of broader project looking to understand facilitators and barriers to the communication of accommodation needs in the workplace. Um, but by virtue of the very unique um, happenstance timing of the survey, the timing of our administration of the survey, we had this really cool opportunity, we think, um, to incorporate questions related to perceptions of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to give you a sense of what we measured, at least um, for this specific study, um, we distinguished between four study groups, those who do not report a disability, those who report a physical disability, those who report a mental health disability, and those who report having both a physical and mental health disability with some pretty um, uh, decent sample sizes there. Um, we also, as you know, you could probably deduce from the title, we were interested in perceptions um, on how COVID-19 impacted firstly people's health, separately people's finances, and we also uh, posed a question around um, sort of people's perceptions of how supported their organizations were, how supported they've been at work um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we captured a couple of sort of basic demographic characteristics as well as control variables. And thinking back to the hypotheses, we were really interested in capturing people's sort of labor market and employment situation. So measuring things like their income, job security, job stress, how trapped they feel within a given job um, and so on as potential explanations for inequities in COVID-19 related perceptions. So moving straight into results, um, conscious of time, with respect to health and financial concerns, so probably not a surprise to those of us in the room today, workers with disabilities reported greater health and financial concerns than workers without a disability. These health concerns tend to be, tended to be more prominent among workers with physical disabilities, while financial concerns were predominant among workers with mental health disabilities. So sort of trying to give you a sense of um, some of the nuances that emerged within the context of um, broader overall findings. Um, and another important nuance, workers with both a physical and mental health disability reported the greatest concerns related to their health and financial security. Um, so some compounding experiences there, we think. Moving on to organizational support, um, again, workers with disabilities reported lower levels of organizational support than workers without a disability. Um, here, nuances as well with workers with both a physical and mental health disability reporting the lowest levels of organizational support, followed by workers with a mental health disability. And among people working with a physical disability, we actually didn't observe much of an association at all with perceptions of organizational support. Finally, uh, I mentioned we were interested in employment conditions and the potential explanatory role these play in some of the previously mentioned um, relationships. So um, again, not a surprise based on what we know. So workers with disabilities did report substantially worse employment conditions than workers without disabilities. Um, lower income, lower job security, higher job stress, and feeling more trapped within their lower quality jobs were just some of the many adverse employment conditions that were reported by people with disabilities. And interestingly, once we statistically accounted for employment inequities between people with and without disabilities, we were actually able to eliminate, um, or you know, we might say explain, the previously described associations between disability status and COVID-19 related perceptions. Um, so to put it differently, employment inequities that sort of predate and set the stage for people's experiences in the pandemic, these inequities, these pre-existing inequities had the statistical power to explain very nearly all the COVID-19 related inequities that we were, um, that we were observing in our data. Um, briefly, just a couple of key limitations. 
We relied on some cross-sectional data collected at um, a single point in time, and it's possible that a whole new set of questions might emerge um, and a whole new set of findings within the context of widespread return to the workplace. Um, I mentioned the sample was broadly representative, but there are always sort of biases that are introduced when people can volunteer in or out of surveys like ours. Um, and finally, particularly sort of setting the stage for, for those who are following in this panel, um, the study was restricted to people who were employed. And so our findings are very likely not generalizable to other groups, such as those who, um, like, you know, including people with disabilities, um, who lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Um, by way of conclusion and sort of situating it within the context of this ongoing discourse uh, in our society around what equitable recovery can look like, um, so just to summarize, during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, workers with disabilities reported greater health and financial concerns, as well as lower levels of organizational support than workers without disabilities. Workers with a physical and mental health disability experienced a disproportionate share of these adverse COVID-19 related perception. That, and that was a really consistent finding um, throughout the study. Adverse perceptions among people with disabilities mapped on very closely to pre-existing inequities and in employment conditions, indicating the need sort of not for a merely biological view of what vulnerability looks like within the context of, a, of an infectious disease pandemic, but a structural view of how social and economic disadvantage and barriers are operating um, for people with disabilities and other groups. Um, and ultimately, we think the study findings highlight um, something that many of us have been saying for a very long time, which is sort of just centering the importance of creating inclusive and equitable employment opportunities for people with disabilities, um, given that these are sort of pre-existing structural problems, right, in our society that don't set us up either for equitable sort of crises or equitable recoveries from those crises. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave leave things off there and hand things over um, to to my fellow panelists. Thank you so much for us. It's always really excellent to hear about the research that's coming out of IWH. I am going to share my own set of slides now. All right. So I would just like to start off by respectfully acknowledging that the Realize office, as well as the home that I sit in, um, is on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So just a little bit about Realize as an organization. We are a national nonprofit and we work really hard to foster positive change for people who are living with HIV and other episodic disabilities. We've been around for quite a long time and what we do with our work is bridge the traditionally separate worlds of HIV, disability and rehabilitation. And the way we do this is by engaging in research, education, policy and practice change. Some of the ways that we enact this work is by being the National Secretariat for the Episodic Disabilities Forum. We host the National Summit on Episodic Disabilities and Employment, which is coming up in March of 2022, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, we are a knowledge mobilization partner on some national and provincial grants. We do active policy work, and we are in the middle of updating our accredited online trainings for HR professionals about episodic disability and work. So the Pandemic Pandora's Box is a piece of research that we did uh, in 2020, and it analyzes the combined findings of two informal community-driven surveys. These were shared openly online. The first one asked working adults or adults who are seeking work in Canada about their experiences of long COVID. And the second asked employers about their comfort level and preparedness to provide workplace accommodations for people who are living with long COVID. Now, long COVID is a prolonged condition and it affects multiple organ systems. And for some, it follows the acute infection period of COVID-19. And what this results in is an unpredictable set of often debilitating symptoms and impairments that can persist for months. We have, as an organization, uh, taken COVID, long COVID into our umbrella of episodic disabilities because of what we have heard from many different activist groups about how it is impacting their health, their well-being, and their lives. So what we found through this particular research is that uh, while 
a lot of respondents, especially employers, were aware of long COVID. Most knew very little about it. There was a lack of understanding of the legal requirements, um, the meaning and the benefits of workplace accommodations, and people with long COVID found that it was both the cognitive and the physical aspects of work that were the most challenging because of the symptoms they were experiencing. These include cough, headaches, migraines, muscle weakness, and brain fog. People with long COVID also faced difficulty, barriers, accessing disability benefits um, because diagnosis of a condition that is kind of a set of symptoms can be very difficult to get. Uh, most of the folks who were living with long COVID who answered our survey uh, disclosed their health status to their employees, but only just over half of them were offered any accommodations in response. Folks who were living with long COVID also indicated a wide variety of accommodations that might be beneficial to them. These included flexible and reduced work hours, as well as the continuing access to remote work or working from home. So the recommendations that we gathered from this particular survey were that people with long COVID need individualized workplace accommodations. Sometimes these may include fewer video calls, uh, that flexible work arrangement, as well as ongoing remote work. Uh, the functional limitations that are caused by long COVID should be the focus for employers rather than asking for medical proof of a condition as a prerequisite for accommodations. Because as I mentioned earlier, it can be very difficult to get a diagnosis for something like long COVID. Um, we also recommend that directors, managers, and HR professionals are provided with up-to-date education about episodic disabilities, workplace accommodations, and long COVID. And we are hoping that there are recommendations that are coming from patient advocacy groups that are also reviewed by employers. This is important and useful information for them. Some recommendations we have for the government are to develop national guidelines that recognize long COVID as a medical condition that can cause impairment regardless of whether or not that person has received a positive COVID-19 diagnosis. We're also hoping to see uh, the government nationally as well as provincially providing guaranteed paid sick leave and we would really love to see and encourage governments to consider a national COVID-19 employment research hub. And I think that's it. Yes, this is my email as well as the Realize website. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any questions. I would now like to pass things over to Helen Anderson. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you, Faraz, for your presentations. My name is Helen Anderson. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Director of Information and Support at the Arthritis Society. So today I'm going to be speaking about including persons with arthritis in COVID-19 recovery. On my first slide in the top left corner, there is the logo of the Arthritis Society, which is the name of the organization, and then the wings of a yellow bird. And on subsequent slides, there is the logo, which just includes the wings of a yellow bird. In case you're unfamiliar with the Arthritis Society, I want to share a little bit of information about it. It was founded in 1948, and we are the largest charitable funder of arthritis research in Canada. We are also a leader in proactive advocacy as well as innovative information and support to deliver better health outcomes for people living with arthritis. Arthritis is an episodic disability that can cause joint pain, stiffness, and swelling and make it more difficult to perform uh, daily tasks. It's also a leading cause of workplace limitations of disability and affects nearly 6 million Canadians. Over half of those affected by arthritis are under the age of 65. There are over 100 different types of arthritis, but these fall into two main categories, osteoarthritis and inflammatory types of arthritis. Osteoarthritis results from the body's inability to repair damaged joint tissue 
clear, leading to a wearing down of cartilage and bone. With inflammatory types of arthritis, the source of joint damage is from inflammation rather than from cartilage wearing away. Most inflammatory types are autoimmune conditions in which the body's immune system starts to attack healthy tissues. And I get into the details of the different types of arthritis here because it is relevant to people's experience of the COVID pandemic. Here on this slide, there's a graph showing the percentage of working age people outside of the workforce um, based on whether they have arthritis or not. So a study that was conducted by Badley et al. Uh, indicated that pre-pandemic, adults aged 20 to 64 with arthritis were twice as likely to report not participating in the workforce than those without arthritis. So 35% of people with arthritis were outside of the workforce compared to 17% of people without arthritis. So even before the pandemic, there were disparities that existed. And on this next slide, it shows the percentage of employed young adults with rheumatic disease pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. Based on research conducted by Jetha et al, it showed that employment rates of Canadian young adults with rheumatic disease dropped from 86% pre-pandemic to 71% following the start of the pandemic. Um, and that the pandemic was associated with 72% lower odds of employment compared to the pre-pandemic period. Furthermore, an international study conducted by the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance found that among 9,300 adult respondents with rheumatic disease, 27% experienced a change in employment status, and there was a 13.6% decrease in full-time employment during the pandemic. In terms of challenges faced by people with arthritis during the pandemic, some medications for inflammatory types of arthritis are immunosuppressants, which means that these medications weaken a person's immune system, which can make someone more vulnerable to infection and to more severe infection. Not everyone with arthritis will be immunocompromised, but for those who are, extra precautions are important. Some medicines can also make COVID vaccines less effective. In addition, during the pandemic, there have been changes to arthritis care, and this can create barriers to accurate information and appropriate care during the pandemic. For many people, there's been a shift to virtual care. And in a survey conducted by arthritis consumer experts in 2021, 32% of respondents indicated that they were unable to receive arthritis specific healthcare services virtually at a time they felt they needed them since March 2020. In terms of suggestions for employers to help support employees with arthritis during the pandemic, when possible, and if desired by employees, to allow employees with arthritis to work from home. So in addition to potential exposure in the workplace, commuting can also put some employees at risk. For staff who are required to return to work, it is important for employers to take the necessary precautions, which can benefit not just employees with arthritis, but employees in general. So this can include examining the workflow of a job to identify risk of transmission, and if necessary, perhaps moving some of the area of work to a different place or changing some of the tasks. Introducing measures to increase distances between people and limiting occupancy of an area as well as providing sufficient paid time off for people with symptoms or exposure to COVID. Before the pandemic, the Arthritis Society conducted a survey of 24 people living with arthritis about their employment experiences. And we heard that due to the severity of their condition or the unpredictability of flares, some struggled with finding and keeping a job. Also working full-time hours could be a challenge, and some were unable to work due to their condition or felt forced to quit because of the nature of their job and lack of support. And some respondents also ended up choosing self-employment because of increased flexibility. So based on these results from our pre-pandemic surveys, as well as work that's been done examining the impact of the pandemic on people with rheumatic disease, the Arthritis Society has 
created some resources to support people with arthritis financially during the pandemic. So we've created a financial wellness guide, which lists national and regional supports and programs for persons with disabilities searchable by province or territory. And while this information is on the Arthritis Society website, it's generally applicable to persons with many different types of disabilities. The guide is available in English and French. Topics include funding and benefits for persons with disabilities, tax credits, non-insured health benefits for eligible First Nations and Inuit individuals, employment services, job training, and skills upgrading programs, as well as funding sources for medical equipment and assistive devices. We are also currently working on a financial survival toolkit, which covers topics such as weighing the pros and cons of buying your own benefits plan if you're not otherwise covered, whether or not to pay into employment insurance if you're self-employed or freelance, drug coverage options if you're uninsured, what is the proposed national pharma care plan, developing skills for the new economy, including free skill building courses online, uh, we would be referring to other organizations' courses um, rather than our own, and emerging technologies and their impact on work. So in terms of working towards including people with arthritis in COVID-19 recovery, it requires a multi-level approach. This involves addressing the health, safety and accommodation needs of people with arthritis in traditional forms of employment, while also preparing for and equipping people with the skills to thrive in a changing world of work. As people with episodic disabilities such as arthritis may choose or be forced to take on more contract or gig work or opt for the flexibility of self-employment, it's important to ensure that they have the knowledge, resources, supports and skills needed to succeed in a shifting work environment. Rapidly advancing technological innovation could serve to reduce the physical demands of many jobs or increase possibilities for remote work, though as Dr. Arif Jetba points out in his work on fragmentation and the future of work in 2020, novel digital technologies could lead to the displacement of routinized or low-skilled jobs or contracting job tasks out, creating higher competition. While possibilities exist for improving the financial circumstances of and employment opportunities for people with arthritis during the COVID-19 recovery period, there also exists the possibility of widening gaps between vulnerable workers and those with more secure employment. Intersectionality also impacts the employment prospects and successes of people with arthritis as well. That is, people with arthritis who are indigenous, racialized, 2SLGBTQ, women, newcomers to Canada, and or low income, amongst other distinctions, face multiple barriers to employment in addition to ableism. We have seen how quickly the world was able to pivot to remote work for many people, to provide income supports to those unable to work, though unfortunately not to the same extent for people with disabilities, and to shift training and professional development opportunities online for free or at a reduced cost. We are at a critical juncture as we turn the corner on two years of the pandemic. Will we take what we've learned from the last two years to create more accessible, equitable, and inclusive employment opportunities? Or will we aim to return to business as usual pre-pandemic, but now with even wider gaps between the systemically advantaged and disadvantaged? Employers have the power to help reshape the future and the Arthritis Society has tools to help employers do this. You can visit our website at arthritis.ca slash work to learn more about how employers can help build a more inclusive future for people with episodic disabilities like arthritis. Thank you. Uh, our next and final uh, panelist is Elizabeth Harrison from the Revision Center at uh, the University of Guelph. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and thank you to all my uh, fellow panelists. This is fantastic. It's, it's been amazing to see all your work. Um, so uh, 
my name is Elizabeth Harrison. Oh, and thank you to Shannon as well for sharing my slides for me I'm having a technical issue. So I really appreciate that, Shannon. Um, so uh, my name is Elizabeth Harrison. I'm a research associate with the From Invisibility to Inclusion Project, which brings together scholars, researchers, business professionals, employers, NGOs, and arts communities with the aim of improving social, economic, and employment opportunities for people in Ontario with episodic disabilities. So specifically, we seek to understand how the needs of people with episodic disabilities can be better addressed in the areas of employment and income support. Um, so unfortunately, my co-authors, uh, Lacey Croft and Carla Rice, uh, are not able to attend today. So I'm representing the three of us. Um, and just to describe my slides really quickly, uh, our first slide is gray with yellow letters and subsequent slides will be dark yellow with black letters. There are no images in the presentation, but the eye to eye uh, logo, which is just the letter I, the number two and the letter I, basically, and then from visibility to inclusion in brackets under, is shown at the bottom corner of each slide. Um, if we could go to the next slide, that would be amazing. Thank you. And um, so uh, in our talk at the um, DWC conference last year, we described how people with episodic disabilities had been excluded in many ways from the old normal, quote unquote, and how some of our interview participants were hopeful that the widespread changes taking place during the COVID-19 pandemic would contribute to improvements in workplace accessibility going forward. So this time we'll highlight interview data from income assistance recipients with episodic disabilities to point out the importance of maintaining the gains that have been made during the pandemic in terms of access in the face of pressures to revert to previous ways of doing things, while also undertaking the additional work that must still be done to ensure that all people with episodic disabilities are truly included in work and social life. Next slide, please. So with the onset of the pandemic, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm behind, sorry. Um, uh, oh, no, I'm right, sorry about that. Uh, so one more, please, one more slide, thank you. Sorry. Um, so with the onset of the pandemic, we saw dramatic changes to normative ways of working and living. More people started to work from home, obviously, and in-person events were restricted. Um, and so these changes were obviously extremely challenging for many of us. Um, but some people with episodic disabilities found that they came with benefits. Um, previously inaccessible social and cultural events became live streams that you could go to relatively easily. Um, work from home policies created flexibility in work location and sometimes even in scheduling. Um, and those are among the most common accommodations requested by people with episodic disabilities. Um, so with work and social life unfolding online, barriers in the built environment and the tolls of travel, which is something that came up over and over in our research, started to become less of a concern for some folks. So as one participant with physical and mental health episodic disabilities shared with us, next slide, please. Thank you. In general, uh, so this is a quotation from a participant. In general, COVID has been kind of good to me. Everyone is suddenly being that much more remote and you can just kind of call in places instead of having to go in. That's so much more flexible for me, not having to get on a bus for like an hour with my anxiety and my back pain. Next slide, please. So at the same time, these kinds of gains um, were less significant um, for people with episodic disabilities who are outside of paid employment. And that came through really strongly in our interviews. Um, so people who met the relatively expansive eligibility criteria for CERB, as we all know, were initially provided with $2,000 a month. Yet in Ontario, people receiving income support were deemed ineligible for that funding, leaving them with a much lower and still inadequate level of support. For example, the ODSP program, which is um, the Ontario Disability Support Program, um, offers a maximum of um, $1,160 $69 for a single adult, um, whereas, you know, that's a lot less than serve. So next slide, please. Um, so one of our participants shared about that, quote, there's just no way it's possible to live even half of a full life. I mean, when Trudeau said that CERB was going to 1600, enough people bitched and moaned that he changed it to 2000. To me, that's an acknowledgement that the government knows that they're punishing us. Next slide, please. Um, so moreover, already vulnerable populations who mentioned relying on food banks had to choose between accessing food and risking their health, unlike folks who could afford the benefits of things like curbside pickup or grocery delivery, as this participant story shows. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we're eating, quote, we're eating one to two meals a day because that's what we can afford. So it's difficult. I mean, when you're lying in bed at 10 at night and you're sitting there eating crackers and drinking tea to fill the hole and there's nothing, the food banks are empty and you can't even go to a food bank anyway because you're immunocompromised. So that's not even an option either. Next slide, please. So participants shared how the pandemic created new categories of expenses, um, such as personal protective equipment, that came up a lot, um, and inflation was raising the price of all necessities, which made cost-saving strategies like comparison and sales shopping impossible, but people on ODSP did not, and similar income support programs did not receive an increase that accounted for those costs. Similarly, participants noted that advances in accessibility produced by the pivot to online are only beneficial to people with access to the necessary technologies, and that can be out of many people's budget. So one participant shared how new work from home opportunities would still be financially inaccessible to her, even if she could physically access them better than in person. Next slide, please. So here's a quote from the participant. I don't have the proper internet speed or the proper connection. So say if I was able to get a job working from home, that wouldn't be possible because I can't even afford the setup, unquote. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to um, technological access barriers to work from home, participants also told us that the potential benefits of flexible work were often outweighed by clawback policies, earning eligibility caps and reporting restrictions. Um, as John Stapleton has explained, ODSP's monthly income rec reconciliation requirement creates a boom and bust for people who have variable earnings. And that leads to an intolerable level of precarity for people with intermittent work capacity, which obviously includes many people with episodic disabilities. Um, and so as our participant stories show, or these little pieces of our participant stories show, although the pandemic revealed the necessity of providing people with adequate income replacement during periods of illness or unemployment, um, <laughs> or, or just, you know, not being able to work for an external factor as happened during the pandemic, the inadequacy of programs like ODSP has still not been remedied. At the same time, the changes that benefited many people with episodic disabilities are under threat as employers begin to encourage workers to return to the inaccessible norms and practices of in-person work. Despite claims that we are now in the post-pandemic era, um, the virus continues to circulate, unfortunately, and it appears that even in vaccinated individuals, infections can sometimes lead to potentially life and career impacting complications such as long COVID, which as Melissa noted earlier, is in itself an episodic disability associated condition. So further, because some people with episodic disabilities are more susceptible to health complications of COVID, um, being required to return to workplaces as pandemic restrictions are being lifted may mean that people have to choose between protecting their health and continuing in their career. And if workers with episodic disabilities are barred from employment by arbitrary policies such as mandatory and office attendance, they may have to turn to income support programs instead. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so now we can think about what inclusion could look like going forward. Um, and so basically due to pandemic restrictions, a lot of accessibility practices that in the past were our participants have told us many times that these kinds of practices like you know, work from home telecommuting, these kinds of things were considered impractical or even impossible. They've been implemented now because of the pandemic and rolling back those kinds of practices would undermine the access gains that are, you know, a, tiny little silver lining in this in this situation. Um, so to ensure the continued inclusion of employees with episodic disabilities, employers should maintain flexibility in location and hours of work going forward. Next slide, please. Um, but we have to mention as well that, of course, while some people with episodic disabilities did benefit from pandemic-related access gains, many others did not. So obviously, essential workers with episodic disabilities continue to face difficult and dangerous working conditions. And as I've been discussing, discussing income report recipient or income support recipients continue to go without basic needs, even as costs increase. So we think that a critical access approach, um, so drawing from the work of Amy Hamry, um, asks what society, including workplaces, would look like if we consider if we centered disabled people and disability knowledges and disability cultures. 
And in this way, we could think about like how we can make access for all the priority rather than understanding access as a matter for individual accommodation or even as an inconvenience that, that we'd rather not deal with. Um, critical access recognizes that access means addressing the needs of all diversely situated disabled people, including people who need financial support. So when disability is centered in designing workplace access practices and income supports, um, it becomes clear that reverting to the inaccessible quote unquote old normal cannot be justified and the ongoing immiseration of people on programs like ODSP cannot be defended. And we think that with a critical access perspective, we can find ways to move forward together, leaving no one behind. Thank you so much. Um, it's always amazing to hear from my colleagues who work in the context of episodic disability and do this kind of research. I always learn such a lot when, uh, when I have the opportunity to, uh, to listen to you present your research. Um, at the moment, we haven't got any questions in the Q&A box, but if anybody would like to type something in there or raise a hand so that we can speak to you, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Ron, have you got any questions prepared that might be helpful for us in this context? Uh, well, let me try something. Oh, it looks like somebody's just placed one in the Q&A. Um, yeah, so sorry, I just noticed that. So from uh, one, one of the uh, audience members is asking, is there a link to more information about the critical access pers perspective that I could share with my colleagues? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I can certainly, um, I will answer that in the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, so we're drawing from the work of Amy Hamre. Um, uh, I, actually, there's a really good video that I'm going to try to find the link to uh, that kind of explains it. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, Hamre's book. So I will pop that into the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose one issue that I wonder about, um, and I'm not sure which panelists might want to take it on, is that you know during the pandemic you have um, a lot more people working remotely, working from home, than before. Um, people with episodic disabilities, um, one of the issues that they often have in accommodation is that their disability tends to be invisible um, and and which means that it may not be noticed and they may choose that they have a they, they choose whether or not they want to actively communicate about it or not and sometimes it can go on invisible um, in the pandemic with so many people working from home has that exacerbated the issue of people um, looking ne perhaps needing accommodation because of a flare in an episodic condition. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you know, not, it may be, be that that's not necessarily the case, but I'm just wondering if any of the panelists in their research have sort of considered that issue related to COVID. I would love to open it up to folks. So if there are panelists, my my little crew, would you please open your cameras? I would love to see you and we could all engage in this discussion. Hi. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, OK, uh, Ron, could you repeat your question just so that we can all get a sense of it? Yeah, so Thank basically you. the idea was that um, one of the challenges, special challenges perhaps, that people who have episodic conditions have is that their conditions are often um, invisible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, and, and they may choose or not to actively communicate about their condition. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in the context of COVID, with a lot of people working remotely, working from home, um, has that exacerbated the the issue of accommodation? You know, so imagining a scenario where somebody's experiencing a flare in an episodic condition, they're working from home, they haven't communicated about their condition recently to their manager. Um, does this sort of exacerbate um, issues around um, uh, accommodation uh, recognition of episodic conditions at work? 
Um, so I don't just I'm not sure if any of the panelists have really touched on this in their work, but I'd be curious about it. Please, Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had um, so in our interviews with folks. So we had interviews with um, people who are employed who have episodic disabilities. Um, uh, across Ontario, and then also people who are on income supports. So we are focusing on income support experiences in our talk a little bit today, but um, certainly I heard from several people that we interviewed who, or you know, we all heard from people that we interviewed who did have those kinds of experiences of the pandemic exacerbating um, conditions like anxiety um, or also exacerbating physical uh, episodic disabilities as well like just due to like disrupting routines and like not having access to things like um uh like exercise facilities that you would kind of that people would ordinarily use to kind of help manage their health conditions um and so um so it, it it absolutely like it did exacerbate the situation for some folks and um i can think of a couple examples of a couple examples in our interviews where people did um uh did have flare-ups and they did actually communicate with their managers um about it and in in at least in one of the cases the it was kind of a it, it was it, it didn't go well um, but i'm not sure if that was um i'm not sure if that was uh caused by the pandemic situation of of working from home or if that just would have been the way it would have gone in that employment situation generally, um, it's it's difficult to say, um, but it's, yeah, people certainly were dealing with those issues. And I could see how absolutely, um, if you're not in kind of that in-person workplace environment, you wouldn't have as many opportunities to like communicate with like your manager or th do things that you would need to do in that situation. But that's a really good question. I'd be curious to know if anybody else had things like that come up for them as well. Faraz or Helen, would you like to weigh in on this particular question? We've got three others in the chat box, so we've got some interest happening too. So, I thought I would just mention um, with the caveat that in the survey, we didn't narrow in specifically on um, uh, people who reported episodic disabilities. And I know, Ron, your question was framed within that context. But a couple of things that are coming up um, either in that study or some follow-up work that we're doing right now that might be of interest is just the not not large conceptual leap between people with disabilities reporting less organizational support at work and the very small I think very reasonable conceptual leap to struggling uh, or facing barriers we should say um, for accommodations and then some work we're doing on now is sort of looking at how the risk of precarity of precarious employment situations are so elevated among people with disabilities and we spend so much time talking about labor force participation and a little less time talking about what does inclusion and incorporation into the labor market today look like and some work we're doing now is showing sort of like a twofold risk um it's not out yet but so maybe i shouldn't say that but like the work we're sort of playing with today a twofold risk in precarity among people with disabilities in Canada and then a twofold risk among people with precarity with respect to not feeling able to disclose and pursue and request accommodations in the workplace so doesn't speak to necessarily to the episodic dimensions of, of the question but um, some intuitive findings that we're trying to um, lend some some statistical quantities to um, Thank you, Faraz. I just wanted to add a little bit in here um, about how I've been doing a, a number of workshops about episodic disability and work with organizations across the country. And these are the kinds of stories and the, the things that I'm hearing. And um, when somebody's condition hasn't been disclosed and they do experience a flare up of that condition while they are working from home, the, the, the added pressure that they experience to continue to do all of the Zoom calls and to answer all of the emails at exactly the time that they are expected to puts an incredible amount of pressure on them. And if there are other elements that they're dealing with, family, other parts of living in a COVID context, um, that pressure then increases. So part of the work that realizes doing with these training sessions around episodic disabilities and work is about encouraging employers to 
begin to ask about accommodation rather than to always rely on their employees to come to them first and to have check-in meetings with employees on a regular basis, not once a year, but more like every few months to say, hey, how are you doing? Do you need an accommodation? How is the timing working for you? Um, I noticed a signature on the bottom of someone's email recently that said, um, if you receive my email outside of your working hours, do not feel pressured to reply to my email. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is the greatest little line of freedom and flexibility that anybody could ever give them. And I thought about how this person's employees might feel when they received those emails. And, and that's the type of small piece of work that can be done by employers that has an incredible impact on the employees, but also everyone as we're kind of working through this. And those opportunities to work more flexible hours, perhaps as an organization, you decide that there is a chunk of time, maybe 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. that everyone kind of needs to be available, but you can juggle your day around that kind of little chunk of hours so that it works for you and your life and the way that your body and your mind work. So, Helen, did you have anything to add to this question? Um, I, think I, I saw some of the other questions and perhaps I can speak a bit more to them. I think there was one about, um, or a couple about working from home. So I'm, I'm happy to wait till we get to some other questions. Okay. Um, I want to just jump into the ones that are in the Q&A. The first one is, can you mention some of the pre-existing structural inequities? And uh, I feel like, Faraz, this was mentioned in your research specifically, so I'm going to hand it over there. But if anybody else has stuff to add, please do. Yeah, I mean, for as long as we've studied patterns of health and well-being, whether it's like during periods of crises, whether those crises are economic or related to public health and so on, for as long as we've studied patterns of health and well-being, um, we have observed how those patterns map on to access to basic social and economic resources in society. So thinking a little bit about the pandemic and what, you know, where we were as a society coming to the pandemic, um, you know, resources of interest might be just even things like social supports and social networks. How much did so many people have to lean onto social networks and social supports in order to sort of um, protect themselves, access certain basic services, groceries, and so on? And who has access to so those social supports and those social networks and who doesn't? And we know that that's patterned by various axes of inequality, including race, class, gender, and ability, right? Um, a little closer to home and a little closer to what many of us were talking about today is sort of the inequities in the labor market um, and in people's employment situation. So just think about how much people um, might have had to rely on public transport versus safer means to get to work. Think about who has access to paid sick leave and who doesn't have access to paid sick leave. Think about the sort of very important conversation that we've had and that I hope is not done around um, how we celebrate frontline workers and yet are okay with many of them making minimum and in some cases sub-minimum wages. And then again, bringing in these axes of inequality, gender, race, class, ability, and so on. And what, the, what sort of our research and many others for a really long time have pointed out to you is that the people who find themselves for no fault of their own within certain positions and places in society that place them at risk of these sort of adverse labor market and employment situations, um, they do map on to sort of um, uh, these social inequities around gender, race, class, ability, and so on. And so that's sort of what I meant by structural inequity. Some people were in much more luxurious boats sailing through the storm than others were. And a lot of that has to do with employment conditions, um, access to labor markets, access to social services and so on. Um, and people with disabilities did not have the same level of access to those social and economic resources. That's what I meant. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm just gonna jump in, Melissa, for a moment. Uh, and thank you for us. Um, that I, I noticed is that there are a few um, questions in the Q and A box um, that I think are related. Um, we might you might want to take them as a set, um, but also um, because uh, for this session 
um, we have the opportunity at this point in time to um, let people um, offer comments or perspectives from their own experience beyond questions. Uh, we had like a networking session that this flows into. Um, um, that there, there will be, a, there is an opportunity if people want to actually um, become a panelist at this point for the remaining 18 minutes of our session, you can raise your hand or let us know in chat um, and, and we can turn you into a panelist and you can actually be seen and be heard and, um, and make your contribution. But perhaps first, Melissa, I'll see if you want to field the questions that are outstanding in the Q&A, and then we'll see if anybody wants to offer a, a comment um, through uh, becoming a panelist. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ron. I, uh, I see that Elizabeth uh, is really wanting to, to jump in here, so I am going to invite them to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it was just like one tiny little thing. I just wanted to add to um, what Faraz was saying that um, the um, like Dennis, Raphael and Toba Bryant have an amazing pamphlet called the social determinants of health, the Canadian facts that's available online. I'm going to put the link in the Q&A um, that really gets into some of like all the details around the different components that, um, that I think Faraz like did an amazing job of explaining, but just if anybody wants further reading. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. All right, so I have a question here from Bonnie and it is about educating HR professionals about accommodations for episodic disabilities and uh, and not to, to be too heavy handed, but I'd like to do a little plug for the workshop that uh, Realize facilitates. It is an hour to two hours. Please email me. I would love to come and do that work um, for you. It's free until the end of March. So please let's try and book something in the new year. I would be happy to connect with you about that. Um, I also see a, a shameless plug here from someone. Um, there is a CHRC publication um, and I'm going to see if I can throw that into the answer for this. Yes, it worked. Okay. Um, the next uh, question is about physical accommodations and work and how that has kind of transferred into adapting home offices. And I, the experience that I have seen and heard is that this is really like organization by organization. It totally depends on things. Um, one thing that I have been trying really hard to do is to instill this uh, this hope in people that employers approach these conversations from a place of trust rather than from a place of suspicion, right? Very few people are trying to steal office chairs, okay? So just this idea um, that employees are trying to take advantage of things is something that we need to sort of try and push out of our minds as we're working in this new context because people are simply looking for a way to continue to maintain their health and their productivity at the same time, right? So this idea that people are asking for what they need should be trusted. And that's what we're trying to encourage with, uh, with our work. And then this leads into a question about increased fear of disclosure, um, possible increased likelihood of COVID-19 in folks who have uh, suppressed immune systems or immunodeficiency issues. And this may be something that folks are experiencing, absolutely. However, I think that we've also, we are beginning to see and have seen over the last couple of years that not everybody has a really broad knowledge of health and immunity. And so it may not be the first place that people immediately uh, go to, that that's not the conclusion that they reach. Uh, it, when someone says that they have um, challenges with their immune system. Um, but again, this is another one of those employer by employer basis sort of issues that, uh, that yeah, again, I think any of us would be happy to, uh, to chat <laughs> and, and to try and explore that a little bit further. And then the last question is, uh, could panelists share their thoughts on whether the influx of disability due to long COVID will act as an instigator for change in recognition and accessibility for people living with other episodic disabilities? And I'm going to hand that over to my panelists to see uh, what they have to say. Anyone? 
Elizabeth, off you go. I, I just, I don't want to be talking too, too much, but if, for those who know me, that's what my, that's what I default to. Um, but I, I actually, I, I really hope so. I hope so. Definitely. Like I was reading, um, um, uh, I follow a lot of uh, folks working on issues around long COVID and, and these kinds of things like on Twitter, for instance, and literally yesterday I was reading a long thread about how um, like perhaps the situation will result in um, better uh better accommodations for and like better recognition of other post viral illnesses. Um, so and like some more work around things like um, myalgic encephalitis, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, which are hypothesized to in some cases be related to post viral complications. Um, and so and like for those of us um, who have familiarity with those worlds, um, we know that like there has there has not been a ton of research, there hasn't been a lot of acceptance in like either the medical or sort of the accommodations world often. Um, and so I'm, I'm very hopeful that like with just the um, the attention that's coming to this and like the increased sort of recognition of like some potential like mechanisms for like how these things work, um, that we we may have um, we ha may have some more recognition <laughs> going forward and some more um, some more understanding of like ways to kind of address this like both um, in sort of the medical world and of course in the world of of employment and accommodation because these things are absolutely critical like in our research we've spoke with like many people who have conditions that have you know similar uh, characteristics to those that are being associated with long COVID, and so we know this has been an ongoing issue, and we can we can just hope that this will be a catalyst for change. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, Helen, or Faraz. Would you like to add a comment here? Um, I, I think if I could just jump back to Sherry and Basil's questions for a second, because I think they relate quite closely to um, a number of people living with arthritis. And I think so Sherry, in terms of your question about if increased fears about disclosure, we received a lot of questions, particularly as um, employees were transition as we were transitioning out of lockdown in Ontario or other parts of Canada and people were being asked to return to work so a number of people who are taking immunocompromising medication who had not disclosed their condition to their employers before were asked were asking about you know or expressing fears about having to disclose because um of the immunocompromised position they were in. So this is certainly something that is definitely on the minds of a lot of people. And we do have, and I know that the Institute for Work and Health and Monique Gignac's project on accommodating and communicating about episodic disabilities does have information about sort of making those disclosure decisions, things to take into consideration um, and how to have those conversations. But definitely, I think a lot of people felt sort of forced to disclose because of the pandemic um, if they were in a situation that they felt put them at greater risk for it. Um, also, just in terms of the home working from home, I think that's a great question because for people with arthritis, whether it's osteoarthritis or inflammatory types, often um, being sedentary can really increase symptoms. So your stiffness is going to be worse if you've been still for a long time. Uh, you know, pain could be worse potentially. And as Elizabeth was sharing, not everyone necessarily feels that they're equipped with the internet connection, with the ergonomic equipment, um, you know, joint protection and having good um, ergonomic equipment is really important for people with arthritis as well. I mean, even just in my own case um, that my I've been working from home, I've been fortunate enough to work from home since a year ago, March, but I didn't have my office chair and so my my sacroiliac joints and in, in my bottom back over time just started to um, cause me a lot of pain and it got to the point that I wasn't able to put on my socks or my shoes or my pants properly I couldn't wash my feet um, and you know so the, and I started having to go to physiotherapy and I'm fortunate enough that I have a cover a benefits plan that covers physiotherapy you know but the, and now I I work from the couch most of the time, but I didn't think that was appropriate for a conference. So I'm sitting in a chair by my window. <laughs> but um, 
I think ensuring that employees have sufficient supports, and Melissa was talking about how it really is on a case by case basis, but that there is information on the government's website online about the duty to accommodate during COVID when someone is working from home. And so, you know, it's not always an easy conversation to have, but talking to an employer about um, the duty to accommodate, even if it is in a remote work situation, um, could be helpful. Okay, and I'm not seeing any more questions. Yeah. Um, and that's where we're, we're actually close to the end of the session, so that's okay. Um, and, and if there's anybody again who wants to volunteer to actually um, you know, raise their hand and let us know if you wanna come on screen and share an experience. Um, but it looks like we, it may make sense. We're only a few minutes away anyway from the scheduled end. It might make sense for us to bring the session to a close and give people a little bit of time have a, sh a short break because the next session starts in like 12 minutes anyway. Um, so, um, so let me thank the panel. I think it was a great series of presentations. Thank you. And a good, a good discussion, stimulating discussion. Um, a lot of complicated issues that we've learned something about and that we have to think about um, going forward. Um, and, and hopefully when we get to actual post COVID, um, there will be some lessons um, that we can learn from this to improve um, uh, inclusion in the workplace broadly um, and particularly for people with episodic disabilities. So thank you again, and we'll close this session and I'll look forward to seeing you at other sessions in the conference. <laughs>